All right. Thank you for turning into episode six of the Occult Professional. I'm here with Christian or the Atlantean Alchemist. Christian, thank you for being with me today. Thank you for having me. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, kind of like where where you come from, how you started as far as any type of practice or religious experience? Yeah, sure. So um, my family's Cuban. So a lot of uh, my families come from Catholicism. Um, and I do have a few branches of family who practice more Afro-Cuban um, religions. So like Santeria and Spiritismo. Um, I wasn't exposed to that that much, but I was um, exposed to um, a bit of like Catholic mysticism kind of mixed in with like Spiritismo. Um, and so I didn't really know a lot about my family history. Um, what kind of got me started on my own path um, I was very much a devout Christian. Um, my mom wanted to pull away from Catholicism when she had me, um, and I was baptized. And so I, I often at that time contemplated a lot on my name, um, you know, the idea of being called follower of Christ and stuff like that. It didn't quite resonate with me, um, but I, I went along with it. Um, I, in the time that I was Christian, um, I wore a cross all the time. I never took it off to sleep or to shower. Um, and I always looked at it as like a symbol of God, but never Christ. I don't know. It, in me seeing Christ and God as the same thing never really, um, registered in my head. Um, I grew up with a more, um, modern version of Christianity. I didn't grow up with the idea of like, you know, you do this or that, you're going to go to hell. Same. I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up with that personally. Um, I grew up more with like the ideas of emphasizing forgiveness and um, unconditional love. Yeah. Um, it was just that what pulled me aside from it was the issues around my sexuality and the fact that it didn't, it wasn't inclusive of that. Sure. Um, and I saw so many terrible examples of people that were in Christianity or in monotheistic religions um, and they were abusing or like misinterpreting information and taking it literally rather than applying it to modern day circumstances. Um, and that really put me off from it. Um, so I was looking for a way to further um, encourage my own sexuality, my sexual exploration. So it was around, I think I was like 16 or 17. I had a creative writing class in high school and the teacher, as I say professor, uh, the teacher, she, uh, had us do a project on finding out our family history to write about our like where our last name comes from. So I don't have a lot of information from my father's side, but from my mother's side, um, I found out that there was actually a lot of psychics, a lot of mediums um, in my family. Um, and that really piqued my interest. And for some reason, my family never discussed any other um, mystical beliefs or anything that seemed kind of out there. Um, one of the things that stood out for me in my past that I never really questioned up until I got older, um, my great grandmother, my great grandfather, um, they have these Afro um, Afro dolls that are like they're like the home guardians. Okay. Like one one is like the protector of my great grandmother, and another one is the protector of me and my um, mother and my sister, and. Um, I can't remember their name off the top of my head, but it was a combination of working with those spirits and the saints that my um, grandmother and my great grandfather did. Um, they used to hold house like little circles of like um, inner family members and they would do like rituals, a lot of mediumship. And I found out as well, like my great great grandmother, she was someone who could look into a glass of water and see the future um, through scrying. And, I found that so fascinating. And the more I looked into my family history, um, the more I wanted to have my own gifts and abilities. I felt like I wasn't tapping into that yet. Sure. So I got into the new age scene, all the like, you know, the basic stuff like crystals, angels, and just focused on that so much and um, the chakras. Um, those were my three things that I focused on for a very, very long time too. I got very confident with it. Um, eventually it led me 
um, from my childhood, I did feel later on a lot of resentment towards Christianity. Sure. Um, because I felt like I wasn't making that connection with the divine that was like promised. I felt like prayers weren't being answered. Um, I wasn't finding that deep commitment of like, you know, the feeling of like the divine is there for you. I didn't feel right. that way for a long time. Um, and it built up as resentment up until like later on um, when I started getting to new age spirituality, it was around the time that I discovered paganism. So I actually, one of the things that I enjoy um, on my free time is to um, watch anime, which is um, Japanese cartoons. And um, I'm, I really, really am fascinated with Japanese culture in general. Um, it was through my fascination with Japanese culture that I was introduced actually to paganism by one of these shows. Um, and the names of these gods that sounded very familiar to me. Um, and I couldn't quite place my name, um, my finger on why they felt familiar, why I felt a, a personal resonance with certain names. Um, and it just led me down a rabbit hole of me exploring mythologies, um, connecting with other people. Um, and as my slowly built up my gifts and abilities um, from the work I was doing, especially with chakras um, and learning and researching like different techniques that can open up your gifts and abilities. Um, I started to learn more and remember a lot of like past lives. And that was a very big thing of my path that's affected me and my decisions. I think even up to this point, um, past, like, um, past life regression has been a very big part of my practice. Um, that's shaped how I perceive myself and um, even the, the gods that are now with me on my path and the angels. Um, an angel, angelic work is still a very big part of my practice, even today. Um, but I've taken many different turns that I didn't think I would end up going down. Um, a large part of those um, past life memories were about um, martyrdom and self-sacrifice and these this kind of theme of like um, putting others first before myself to the point of self-destruction. Sure. And I had to um, experience this multiple times in the sense of like, um, not only in the memories, but in instances of relationships where they were um, romantic or in friendship and client. Um, and it was an experience I had around uh, 2018 um, that basically just put me on, I had this ultimatum put before me. It's so like, you could either do the same thing and keep struggling, or you can choose to put yourself first for the first time. And when I chose to put myself first for the first time ever, that's when the whole path workings with the um, infernal divine began, um, where it was them kind of empowering me to put myself first. And I had to work through a lot of um, misconceptions that Christianity put in my mind about what these spirits are um, and what they're all about because it's easy to kind of have that mentality that, you know, darkness equals evil and light equals good. Right. Um, and I had to slowly learn that that wasn't really the case. Um, and you have to think of them more like people. It's kind of like, there's no such thing as a purely evil person right. or a really good person. Um, we have a bit of everything within us and it's our experiences that shape us um, as well as um, some stuff brought on by nature and like astrology and stuff like that that affect our personality but um it was by that those understandings that i realized that you know they're not as bad as everything everyone says um the problem i noticed once i stepped into that kind of community is that everyone had this there's this um aesthetic that they wanted to kind of push out this sort of like edge lord kind of thing like everything has to be dark terrifying horrifying and then that is supposed to be so badass or um right. however that like it was that aesthetic that puts off a lot of people and i realized this with a lot of content creators that focused on this sort of like dark edginess because they went from my understanding from one extreme to another so they were caught in um monotheistic traumas from sure. those from their previous religions and they brought that trauma turned it into anger and rage and then they went to the other extreme of making everything about dark 
lightness and edginess. And I realized this and I was just like, this doesn't help people to understand a balance and the, what these spirits are all about and their intentions. And so a lot of my work lately has been about showing people that, you know, something that I think of it also kind of like in an analogy where it's like, if you are given something that nourishes you, that may not be nourishing for someone else. It may Absolutely. be someone else. Um, you know, nothing in excess. And that was the kind of mentality that helped me to kind of get out of that mindset um, of darkness equals people. And I found that actually a lot of um, darker spirits work really, really well with angels. And that's kind of been my work of uniting those energies together in my workings. Um, I know I don't discuss it a lot online about my, um, my devotions and um, with my gods and stuff like that, but um, they were a very big part in kind of moving me through these past lives um, and having the confidence enough to even get myself out there publicly. Um, and during the pandemic, um, I built a lot for my business and I even um, gained my Reiki master certification um and just can be growing ever since that's awesome i think one thing that sounds really beautiful is that you said that when you started really looking out for yourself first that you started connecting and ex experiencing or experimenting anyway with the infernal side of what we would call consider angels and demons and i think that's really beautiful because um in the abrahamic story right there's that rebellion that's the difference is that these these beings turned away and said i don't want to look out for man first i want to I want to live life for me and experience that radical freedom. I think you are right, though, because um, I come from a Catholic background. And when I think about demons today, I think about automatically those edgelord type people, right? Because they're, it's almost like this, this it's, it's, it is a trauma response, right? If, if you come from these harmful places where you did not feel like you fit in and you go from zero to 100 real quick, so you're going to represent that that light, that love and light type of, you know, we are Christians by our love type of thing. And then I could see it being very attractive to just embrace that darkness. But it sounds like when you um, started working with the infernal side that you didn't necessarily find that darkness. You found something else. Is that right? Yeah, it was. So essentially, and I forgot to mention this um, earlier that it was through, I think it's because I healed so much of my um, trauma from monotheistic religion, like um, Christianity, um, with paganism, because it gave me a new perspective on how the gods operate, um, especially when I got a lot more um, deep and rich con um, contact. And so when I came from the healed space, um, rather than rejecting light for darkness, I found that there was something else in darkness. And now my understanding of darkness is that it's untapped potential. It's kind of like the power held within us that we're not aware of. It's the um, parts of ourselves that we're not fully accepting or embracing of. But by unifying that aspects and bringing it into awareness and realization, we become a lot stronger, a lot more whole. Um, and that's really where I think um, true ethics belongs and true morality. I feel like people are so focused on the idea of being good people. I feel like we all wanna be really good people, but it's really not that we should be good people, it's that we should be the best per people that we are. Sure. Um, looking to reach that potential. And in turn, you become a good person because you're embodying all that you are in your power. Um, so I think there is an important balance between um, both giving and being of service, while also being um, someone who focuses and nurtures themselves. It's kind of like the analogy of an airplane. When an, air when an airplane is going to crash, you are going to put your mask on first before you put the mask on of the person beside you. Sure. Um, and I think that's a mentality that we have to approach in our practice. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Um, earlier, you were talking about um, how you explore different techniques and exercises to kind of help you bring that healing and kind of explore the, the pathways of your lineage 
to like manifest those different types of abilities. Can you walk us through some of those, what, what you kind of did to, to bring those, that realization or those changes on? Um, so what I did initially was I, I worked on, I did a lot of chakra work. So I would work on each individual chakra for about a month of at least for an hour. I would meditate on those chakras doing the initial um, seed chants, the crystals associated with those chakras and the initial visualizations. Sometimes I would change it up because you get very bored of doing the same thing repeatedly for a month. Sure. So I would switch to guided meditations, different types of music, all associated with that specific chakra. Um, and you would notice some changes. When you first open them up, um, I noticed that a lot of traumas start to be released. Um, and you have to go kind of like from the root chakra upwards. You can't skip all of them and go up to like the third eye because it, it makes you very unbalanced as a person. And you're skipping all the traumas that you have basically because your lower chakra is carrying most of your trauma. Um, so by working through them each month, um, individually, I eventually got to about the third eye, and that's when your abilities can really open up. That itself didn't activate all my abilities right off the bat. What it did open up for me was I had a lot more visions. Um, my imagination was a lot more clear. Um, I could feel and sense things that I couldn't normally sense or feel. Um, and it was just very subtle. The actual training for it i think where i started out with was um through tarot so through divining um what i would do is i would have the cards laid flat so when i would pull a card ask a question i'd intuit the information first write down my impressions and then i would turn the card over and then um, check if i got the information correct and by doing that several times you start to build the confidence in your own intuition sure um Another thing was, it was a, a visualization exercise where you would close your eyes and you would imagine someone holding balloons and each balloon would be a different color. And you would just, you would have to try and imagine them each kind of appearing simultaneously. And as um, the more vivid it became, the more easier it was for you to actually do like clairvoyant work where um, you could see more visions and stuff like that. The past lives kind of came up on their own. What I did notice, though, is um, there's an area here in the back of the neck mm -hmm. um, that I actually looked up. I don't know how this, the information, if it is accurate. It's called the mouth of God chakra. This area right there in the back up of the top of your neck, by placing stones like lapis lazuli or um, crystals associated kind of with the third eye, sort of throat chakra ones like dark blue stones um you would put them there um and by working the energy in that area i noticed that i had a lot more um past life experiences how did your um, how, how did you how do you experience I've, I've never had a past life experience i've heard heard quite a few bit about them what what is that like like what is that experience akin to um, it's kind of like a cinema scene it's really strange um so you'll it's like you disassociate for the moment of that um the pictures kind of coming into your head but you're filled with such raw emotion like you are the person in that cinema that's kind of being played in your head um and you really it's it's very strange it's like a couple it's always like a couple seconds it's not very long but it's like suddenly you're taken back into this time period um, and all these interactions and you feel all the emotions um, as if they were your own, like you were living them out right now. Um, and then it would just end. And then you, you just, you'd snap back and you're just like, what just happened? It was, that's kind of how it, how I, I, how I have experienced it. Awesome. Um, so you said before that you don't, you don't generally talk about like the different deities and things that you work with. Um, do you, do you mind sharing about anybody that you work with? Yeah, of course. Or that you're drawn to. Um, so my path, when I first started out in paganism, um, through being inspired by, um, anime and the show that kind of introduced me to specific names, 
um, my first god that I was ever introduced to was Baldur. Um, Baldur is the Norse god of light, reconciliation, and uh, friendship. So he was someone I was very drawn to because I think it was a really good gateway from Christianity to paganism. Um, so he helped me a lot with forgiveness because that was a very big thing with me. Um, and because I was going through kind of my spiritual awakening, I was struggling with um, connecting with people because I felt like a lot of my relationships before were very superficial. And I couldn't see that before until I was doing those inner workings. Um, so after um, a certain point, um, I was introduced to other gods, um, such as Freya. Freya is the Norse goddess of love and war. Um, and she has stayed with me. She is my matron goddess now. Um, and he was kind of just like a bridge for me to be open to those energies. Um, and I've worked with darker gods as well, such as the goddess um, Hela or Hela, who is the Norse goddess of death. I worked with her for a very long time, up until the passing of my great grandfather in like 2017. Um, she taught me the importance of learning the wisdom of elders, um, to be more um, observational, to hear the stories of the dead, um, and to respect them. Um, so she taught me very time honoring things, um, and to like respect elders. And she taught me how to not procrastinate and to keep a very strong work ethic and to always be tidy and organized. Uh, that was kind of her um, lessons for me. Um, and then Odin came through later on, who is the Norse god of wisdom and war. Um, and for some reason, there has been a weird theme of war gods coming through between Freya and Odin. Then later on, it was after the events in 2018 where I finally chose to put myself first that Athena came through um, and she helped me the year after um, the emotional recovery of those events. Um, and those have been my three main gods. Um, and then later on my path um, with working with the demonic divine Hades and Persephone came through, which um, is another god, but the Greek god of death. Yeah. And um, the goddess Persephone, the goddess of spring, um and death as well so she's kind of like plays a duality and i think she was helping me to embrace um finding my own divinity within nature and balancing my aspects of how i see myself both in light and in darkness rather than seeing as two things that are separate seeing them as the same side of the two of sure um one thing I, I think it's really important it, it reminds me of this is that whenever we see somebody, we have to realize that we're, we're all hearing through our own scars, right? We're all, we're all experiencing things through our own pain. And it's, it's really, it's really almost a privilege to be able to take the time and learn that you can work on yourself instead of helping everybody else all the time. Because those types of experiences that, because I've come from a very similar place where like, I often sacrificed a large part of myself to help other people at the expense of myself, where I was always taking care of everyone else, but not myself. And when I started to take care of myself, there are these dramatic changes. And I think a lot of that had to do with a lot of the healing that you have to do by looking at the, the, the darker aspects of yourself, or maybe the more painful aspects. And maybe the fact you need to realize that like, maybe I was the type of person that let people walk all over me and manipulate me for their benefit. And when you realize that you can start to confront those things and embrace them, like you were coming from a good place, but at the same time you were harming yourself and being able to confront those aspects of yourself and embrace them, allow us to take that power and run with it, to flip it around and realize that I'm not being selfish. I'm being selfish. I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of myself now, not at the expense of other people. I'm not manipulating people to become a better version of myself. I'm just taking the time that I need to find my own place in this world and my own healing. And I think that's something that is very difficult for a lot of people to do. But what I have found while diving into the cult philosophy and things like that is that it's almost like rule number one. You have to be able to know those parts of yourself to become any sort of competent magician, major or witch. And I don't know. I think that's beautiful. I think that I think it's kind of interesting that you, you had a lot of deities associated with like death and war too, right? Because that's kind of like that internal conflict within ourselves all the time. Like, yeah, there's actual death and actual war. 
when we think about death, like in the tarot, we, we don't always think about somebody dying. We're thinking about the idea of part of us dying or part of someone dying and giving space to like new life and new experience, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. And I, I think a large part of why so many workouts kind of come into my path is um, because they want me to be a leader. They want me to build my confidence enough to be put, to be able to put myself out there. And they're very big on strategy and planning and structure. Right. And that's something that I need a lot. That's a very big part of my path. Um, and through my work, I think my main goal and all my efforts is to try and help encourage other people to find their own path, to not be afraid that even if something, even if you can't find the right label for what your path is called, um, following what's true for you is going to lead to something more fulfilling and more rewarding at the end of it all. Absolutely. Um, when I first got into this myself, like I didn't have, I didn't have a mentor, right. Or a guidebook or whatever. I, I came from a very Christian Catholic type of background. And I, I feel like my practice still incorporates a lot of what I would call Catholic magic, a lot of veneration with angels and saints and, and working with those beings and having a relationship with those beings. Um, but then I dabbled with things outside of that path and I incorporated those two um, to things that made sense to me, the things that work. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday, the day before, like a lot of people are quick to like, to, uh, I see a lot of people talk about Hermes, a lot of people talk about Hakate and they push and push and push and push them. Um, and while I think it's popular and great for those who it works with, I don't think it's for everybody. And I don't think everybody needs to explore those avenues. Like when you can find, when you, when you are approached by something, like, for example, when I work with Michael, I was approached by Michael. I didn't approach Michael. Like that's a much more powerful experience. I think than like checking out like five books and seeing they all mention Kate. So I'm going to work with this being now or work with Hermes um, when that might not just be the right path for you. So I, I find it admirable that you want to encourage people to find and explore their own path, because I think that's super important because there's, we have one life to live and there's a history of magic like behind us and a future of magic before us. And it is so vast that there's not a possibility that you can explore it all, not in depth anyway. And so I think that's, that's wonderful. I think more and more people need to encourage people to like, kind of like reach outside of what people think is cool or popular and really dive in and see what makes them tick and what they want to have a relationship with, which I think is just awesome. Um, so you, um, what, I guess, what do you find, what do you find the most useful or important, I guess, of working with um, infernal and angelic beings? You said you like blended that energy earlier. Like, what do you mean by that? Um, so with angels, they're very focused on divine will. So they're very focused on your own higher good in terms of your what your higher self wants like they're very concerned with the divine, the divine structure of things angels are very focused on construction order and preservation of creation um the infernal divine is very focused on restructuring um demolition um so they carry more of that death and rebirth energy um, when it comes to things. And while angels are more about the preservation and the order of what is what already stands. Um, so when I work with them or united, I'm kind of completing those cycles of like creation and destruction, um, depending on the path working. Um, like for example, um, there's Archangel Raphael, um, and there is a goetic spirit called Viewer. Buer is also a spirit of healing. Both of them yeah. get along really, really well. Um, and when you bring them together, you, you bring forward a whole nother degree of healing. So for example, Raphael is very focused on healing the physical body and maybe even the spirit. And um, Buer is focused more on the emotional aspects and the mind. Um, so when you bring them together, you have a more holistic treatment um, for healing obviously contemporary or like um complementary to yeah medical but 
they they come together in unison and complete something that they couldn't originally do one by themselves or it would take much longer i am a bit familiar with your just by the the keys of salomon um when i first started looking into things like that people were like what are you why are you reading about demons things like that i'm like have you read about this beer guy he does not seem like a bad guy at all i feel like i feel like a lot of things are taken out of out of context or when you read Josephine McCarthy, she's very much like every every being has its place in the balance of existence. And a lot of times we're quick to like be afraid of names and types of beings that they are. But at the end of the day, like everything has its spot. So like when I first started reading the Keys of Solomon, I was like, oh, this beer guy sounds really interesting. If I were to talk with a demon, that would actually be the one I want to talk to. Like it's like not only healing, but like um, all matters of natural philosophy, right? And wisdom. And like, that's beautiful. And you're right, there is Raphael on the other side of that. Um, in your experience, are there other kind of those complementary aspects for people like say like Michael, Michael or Gabriel? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of it right now. Um, I do notice, um, so there's a spirit in the Goetia called Belial. He works actually, he could actually work really well with Mikael um, because they're both solar spirits. Um, so when I've worked with them together, they bring about such an intense amount of protection um, that is even beyond just like the energy you feel from Mikael where um, you would already feel protected from him, but this time it would feel like you have an actual fortress around you. Um, that's how powerful it feels when you have them together um, on a working. Um, and one thing I also want to um, iterate is that with the Goetic spirits, you see a lot of their lore. Like, for example, with Belial, it says, like, all he does is lie or um, is a very destructive spirit. But when you actually connect with the spirit, um, and what I always do if I don't know a spirit, um, especially if the lore is kind of, like, weird and gives me an impression that they might be a concern, even though I'm feeling right. that right I will always open circle. I will do all the necessary protections and I'll have my first initial, um, maybe the first three interactions with them in some sort of safe, protected space um, and have those conversations. So like, um, like doing the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, and then opening up circle um, and then doing the lesser banishing ritual, um, LBRP once again, after the circle and you, and you close it. Um, but my interactions with Bilal have been very, um, really nice. And he's more, <laughs> if you were to, I would say he's the antithesis of Mikael's personality in terms of stoicness and being very built around um, like law and order. He's right. more like, I make the rules, I'm here. Um, if you need, you know, for things to work out in your favor, I'm here for you. He's like, almost like a mafia boss. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in personality, but um, comes off very mercurial, very um, spontaneous, a lot more friendlier than you would think in, from what the lore says, where he's like, oh, all he does is lie. And when you speak to him, he's blunt. Um, and sometimes I feel like we need to affirm our, what we resonate with and follow that through, even if you just have to put some additional precautions and see through what actually is the truth for yourself. Because sometimes I think of it too, that maybe these experiences people have had with certain spirits, um, maybe that it was the way that they treated those spirits that they appeared and came to them in that way, or they were just demonizing the information. Right. I think, I think that's something that's very common is the demonizing of information. Um, I think you're actually part of this conversation on Twitter, the word, the phrase God spouse has come about. And a lot of people have just like, flip their lid over this and instead of flipping my lid I was like not sure what a god spouse is I'm gonna go look that up and I think you did a brief video on this too um I the something that's really important with no matter what community or what you're looking into is not to demonize information at face value not to look at a word and think that sounds really weird because it's probably a lot less weird once you look into it um to me when I looked up God spouse, for example, um, I found it to be very similar with how I interact with Mikael or Raphael or Mary. Um, 
a lot of the same type of relationship patterns and devotional patterns. And so when I looked into him, like, that's not weird at all. And I don't understand, I guess, I guess I don't understand, especially the older we get, the, the fact that we would not want to confront our initial biases with things. I think that is super important. Like we, we all have confirmation biases where it's like, for example, there are going to be a lot of people um, who might come across, across this or across you or I on Twitter and be like, oh, these people are talking about demons. I'm going to block those people, not interact with those people. Like that's not okay. And it's because of these built up biases and all they've ever seen are sources that confirm those biases. And it's often easier to find those things because it goes along with their opinions and their preconceived notions. Um, if you had to point someone in a direction to confront their biases with things like the infernal, where would you, where would you point them? Um, so with me, how I kind of confronted them, um, my first sphere that I ever worked with of the Goetia was Dantelion. Um, so he was the first one I worked with. He helped me through the subconscious biases. Um, because he is a spirit who can, one, he reads the minds of others. He understands and can interpret what you're feeling and thinking and can help you kind of navigate that. That was my, how he helped me. Um, and he's a spirit that can also shift um, subtly the, like the subconscious um, thoughts and feelings of the um, of the person so he helped me to shift my perspective and see it from a different perspective a more compassion and understanding and perspective um so one thing that i would say that would help someone else is like maybe not necessarily working with him if that's not something you're drawn to but um i would say is the idea of you need to be aware of like the media you surround yourself with because whether we believe it or not they're like even like the most silliest of shows, the, the contrast of protagonist and antagonist, the protagonist is always some like light, um, someone shrouded in light, like a knight in shining armor or paladin. Um, and the antagonist is always dark, twisted, um, traumatized person. Um, and we're constantly fed the narrative of good versus evil. Um, by those associations, even in the media that we receive literally daily. Um, so we have to be more mindful of that. Um, and I think we have to first follow our initial gut impression of something. When we speak the name of something, especially a spirit, feel into the energy of that name. What does that name make you feel when it's said? Um, especially when people talk about their experiences. Um, that's why I like to look at a lot of secondhand accounts, um, because it gives me a better understanding of the nature of the spirit, um, as well as how you feel about the spirit as the person talks about them. When you um, say secondhand account, do you mean like anecdotal, like someone's, like someone you know, talk about that experience? It could be someone you know, or like uh, someone just doing a video on like YouTube talking about their experiences. Sure. Um, I found that that has helped me a lot. Um, and also like the more you commit to the interactions, the more you feel out their energy and the more you're starting to build that bond, your biases kind of leave you little by little. Um, it honestly took me about over a year to undo my own biases. Um, I know some people may have more biases. Um, I've had a lot of support though from them telling on and kind of changing my perspective. Um, where do you... where do you see yourself going with the type of work that you're doing right now? Like, what do you want to focus on going forward? Going forward, um, I'm looking to incorporate a lot more um, herbalism into my practice. Um, I want to work a lot more with the plant magic because I find that um, a good way to understand divinity, especially um, something that it, um, integrates both polarities, so you don't feel like you're constantly fighting between the idea of like, oh, am I too much into darkness? Am I too much into light? Because that was a big narrative that was coming up for me too. Like, um, am I too much over here, over there? Um, and I find that my own path is very middle ground oriented. And I feel like nature, which embodies polarities and contradictions, 
um, like even to the idea that um, plants have a male and female part to them. Sure. Um, I feel like by connecting more with nature, I'm being able to integrate that more and balance myself out more, a lot more easily. Um, so I've taken on the idea of being a, a hedge witch in my own practice and what that means for me, um, especially incorporating it into spirit work and um, because I'm very animistic. So I see, you know, um, stones, crystals, anything of nature as kind of possessing their own spirit. Sure. And this often comes from like Shintoism, which was a very, very big influence on my um, practice. So by viewing the, you know, everything that's sacred and divine, I feel like I can find greater balance in myself. And I want to teach other people to respect the divinity within other things and build those necessary relationships. I think we're often too afraid to explore our own impressions. I think that's beautiful. Something I started exploring a couple of years ago was the idea of looking or finding the divine in the secular, right? Making the secular sacred. Because there are a lot of things that people take for granted um like even being able to drive to work or getting yourself dressed or the fact that we have like running water and taking all those things that we take for granted looking at almost like a spiritual experience like i am able to do this because of this my life is easier because i have this running water like life is there for me i have access to food things like that and exploring the idea like that tree outside my window right now is is a beautiful expression of the divine essence. Um, when I left the church, the closest I felt to a holy experience was often like in the woods, um, like surrounded by trees and the birds and other animals, the sound of running water, sometimes if I'm near a river or a stream. And I felt much more connected to the divine experience there than I ever did in any holy place, holy place that was built. Um, and so I, I definitely feel that. I think that's a, a beautiful way of looking forward. Um, I know my partner is interested in exploring different parts of that, like herbalism and and really working with land and growing her own herbs and things like that and exploring those pathways. Um, where would, so who, you said that you were originally kind of influenced into paganism from an anime you used to watch. When you started going exploring those avenues who did you look to read like where did you find your information what what kind of inspired you from that point on um so what initially started my interest in magic was and and paganism was um i was getting into the idea of um tumblr so tumblr was very big at the time um particularly for my generation and um it was just a hot spot for information and sometimes obviously misinformation as well additionally it's very similar to tiktok um but in a non-video format um it was more like blog posts similar to twitter um so there it, it sparked my interest with posts um i think originally i was drawn to wicca i never really became wiccan i was just interested in the religion itself and mm -hmm. um the components of it um, it was originally I was just there um, simply for just my own enjoyment because I do like a lot of um, video games and getting into um, appreciating anime and Japanese culture and stuff like that. So that was a very big part of just like my leisure time. Um, eventually, I began looking at the tags for like magic and witchcraft. And I met some people um, who... I had some ties with from like past lives um, through just some random occurrences that I don't think I would ever like meet in person. Um, and it opened up the doors to me and like exploring my own path and um, witchcraft and magic and the gods. Um, so that really was what started it for me. Um, but the book that really got me started on the path was the book called um, Gay Witchcraft by Christopher Penzak because it explored the idea that um, homosexuality or any kind of um, shift in difference of gender or sexual orientation plays a role in um, divinity and spirituality and like its origins and the history of like these um, prominent figures that were um, LGBT. And it spoke to me in such a deep level because 
I felt so, I was yearning to find like the spiritual meaning behind my identity and my um, sexual orientation. So by reading that book, um, it opened the doors to me and like the full exploration of who I wanted to become um, beyond the idea of just building up psychic abilities and connecting with crystals and angels it opened up a whole new world, essentially. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful, especially coming from a place where, you, like you said earlier, like in the Catholic Church, like you, they didn't really have space for, for you, um, which is really hard. I actually talked to somebody not too, too long ago about a similar thing where it, he, he battled with his faith along with his sexuality. And to me, that sounds extremely disheartening and heartbreaking. But at the same time, I'm happy that you were able to find someone outside of that that allowed you kind of to explore that and embrace that divine beauty within yourself and be like, Hey, I'm, I am an expression of, of God or the divine or creation. Right. And that's, that's incredibly powerful. You'll have to um, send me a, a link to that book so I can share at the bottom of this video so that we can okay. expose other people to that. Um, like, it, I, I think that being able to be confronted with those voices um, because we, we very much, I'm, I'm 36. So like I've been around since 85 and I've seen an incredible evolution in how we have interacted with the LGBTQA community since I was a child. Um, I am happy that we are progressing. I don't think we've progressed far enough. Um, but being able to be in, inspired and in touch and encounter those types of authors and exploring those topics um, even if confronting ourselves with those topics, I think is important because we need our worldview shattered continuously. We need to be able to explore and understand where other people are coming from. And that now I think you have to try really hard to stay conservative and ignorant in those types of situations because there's so much information, um, be it scientific or psychological. And like, if we take those things, science and psychology very seriously and magic and in many religious practices today, we should take that personally and seriously within our day to day interactions. Um, so you're definitely going to share that book with me. Um, I'll, I'll share a link at the bottom. Um, you were telling me earlier that you were, um, you got your new website set up. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I, I've been planning to have my website set up for a while now. Um, I have a blog on there, just a few posts I've done in the past. Um, I've talked about um, embodying um, and doing um, like specific chants and rituals to embody the um, attributes of spirits that you work with. Um, I've talked about the importance of tantalizing your five senses so this is also something they do in spa work which i didn't know of until after uh, making this blog post i talked about the idea that to find deep healing you have to tantalize your five senses such as creating an environment that's conducive of healing with um working with the five senses so like creating a an environment like um, where you're very cozy where you're very comfortable as touch um, maybe incense burning or candles lit um, for scent, um, even something like chocolate, anything that's like an aphrodisiac. Um, then there is um, like healing sounds, like very soft music or anything that just kind of um, calms and soothes your spirit. Um, and just, and even visually, maybe uh, a guided meditation or something or tantalizing those five senses brings a lot about an insane and more rigorous amount of healing I've noticed um and that was something that was shared with me from my work with Freya um uh, and then there was the idea of doing a self-dedication um to your own path so that you um feel more connected to it if you feel disconnected from it or um you feel that you've veered off from something that feels very clear to you those are some blogs I've done in the past that are on my site. Um, and I just got my services up today where um, I offer a service called um, Stella Terra. Stella Terra in Latin means earth star. 
So that's just, um, that's me um, doing either tarot or oracle card readings for about an hour, where I also channel messages from the spirits, um, be it your own team or a specific spirit in particular. Um, that's one service I offer. I also offer a service called Sana Ora, which in Latin means um, healing hour. So this is where I do my Reiki service. Additionally, um, I do light language. Um, to describe light language, I have it broken down on my website, but to say it um, um, for this um, recording, um, light language is something I would say is similar to um, speaking in tongues Okay. Um, in that sense. But the difference is that it, what it does is not something to understand logically, it's something to understand um, emotionally and your energy shifts as it happens so it's like an intentional speaking of sort of like an astral language um that kind of is a form of channeling um so that's combined with the reiki as well as um crystal healing modalities um for that santa ora session is that brought on i, I don't for the santa ora is that brought on in the same kind of ecstasy that speaking in tongues would be brought out in like that type of I don't know. Yeah, ecstatic experience, I guess is what I would call that. Um, it depends on the specific intention. So what I would do is I would set the intention for whatever the healing session is going to be about. Um, and the words that come out are in correlation or in relation to that. So whatever I set the intention for is kind of what you feel. Awesome. And you'll feel it maybe like as um, tingling sensations. You'll feel it as like... Um, Maybe you'll get, uh, I forget what you call it, the um, chills. Bumps. Yeah. Um, you may feel like um, a sense of just like a lot more calmer, a lot more at peace. Um, or you may feel more elevated, more um, like you're connecting with the divine or maybe you'll receive visions. Um, it depends on the intention. Beautiful. Um, I definitely want to link your website and your Twitter um, and I can put your Instagram on there too below here. Um, is there anybody who is looking into the, the type of work that you're doing? Any advice that you would give somebody initially going into something like that? I would say that it's important to take your time with it. Don't feel like you have to reach a destination or label your path or practice, especially if you're very, very unsure about it. I'd say the best thing you can do is to be very thorough because I know when you opening up to all of this, you're so overwhelmed by the information and you feel like you just want to keep exploring and you just kind of want to get a touch of everything. The best thing you could do is be thorough and fully commit to whatever you're exploring in that moment, one thing at a time. Um, at least a month or more, um, like a month to three months into whatever you're delving into, um, commit to it for that time period, or if, um, even longer if you feel drawn, but um, to be very detailed and rigorous in what you're covering, because it's going to form the foundational basis of your path, and it's going to help you with the discernment later on, especially if you're starting out. Um, discernment is a very big issue that comes up. Um, where you have to start to learn to trust your intuition and build your confidence a lot more. And so that's going to be the main focus. Beautiful. Is there anything you want to um, talk about before we go? Um, the only other things is I have a few more things of the services that I have. But sure, go for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Plug yourself away. That's what this is about. <laughs> your story. Um, I also have a business consultation, um, not business consultations, but spiritual consultation. So if you want to have a, like a one-on-one -on -one with me, where I just kind of guide you through whatever you're experiencing on your path currently. Uh, I could give you pointers or give you techniques that can might help you in whatever you're um, working through at that moment. Um, and I also have spell services. So I do um, uncrossing and road opening ceremony where I clear out um, like all the energies that are holding you back and open up the path roads um, for you to experience more prosperity or more um, opportunities in your life. If you feel your life has gotten very stagnant or maybe you have something attached to you from either past lives or um, something that maybe have, you don't clear your energy often and you're holding on all, these, all this energy from other people that's not your own, 
and it's weighing you down and keeping you from moving forward. I offer a ceremony to kind of clear all that out. Um, I also do a psychic development and expansion ceremony for um, helping people to build up their gifts and abilities um, to open up those um, pathways for them. And the last thing that I offer is um, a spirit pact service. So if you wanted to form a pact with a spirit, um, like let's say you have the intention to want to take it better care of your health um, and what the other spirit may want, because some people struggle with spirit communication or haven't figured out what their main modality of communication is. Um, I am kind of the medi mediator between that and what they would want from you um, to help you towards that goal if it's um, something very specific. And in the spirit pack service, you would also, whatever item is most prized and, um, and you like that makes you think of that spirit, I will um, do a ritual on that item from long distance where that thing will now be a vessel for the spirit where you could connect with that spirit um, daily through that as like a piece of jewelry or what have you. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Christian. I, I appreciate you being here. Um, I, I'm excited to, to follow more of your work um, and check out your website, um, especially that, that your five senses thing you were talking about. I like the idea of, of kind of like that sensual experience and experiencing all those things at once to kind of promote that kind of feeling and understanding of yourself. That's beautiful. Um, but thank you for so much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I will be sure to link all of your information below. You'll have to send me some, some stuff so I can share on the bottom of the description. Um, we can send some people your way and uh, have people explore your services there. Um, but thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah.